Okay, we are into the gram negative phyla now. And again, we have two of these. We have proteobacteria and the bacteroidetes. We'll talk about uh, this group. Uh, we have super huge amount of diversity in the proteobacteria and the bacteroidetes are very important for us uh, microbiologically in our gut. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of specific diseases caused by gram-negative bacteria. So the proteobacteria, um, this is a super diverse group. And scientists are uh, thinking about maybe splitting it up. There's so much stuff in there. Um, we have basically every form of metabolism in there. Uh, we have cocci, spiral-shaped cells, rods, um, heterotrophs, lithotrophs, photosynthesizers, pretty much everything is in there. Um, these are all gram-negative staining, and they have that unique cell wall structure. Um, some ones we've talked about, um, agrobacterium tumorifacians uh, can cause tumors in plants, uh, but it's also very useful for actually transforming DNA into plants. Um, Coxiella brunettii causes Q fever, Escherichia coli, which uh, pathogenic strains can cause infections and uh, be very deadly, but it also is our main research organism. Um, Helicobacter pylori can cause stomach ulcers. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea, which is in here, which causes the sexually transmitted disease gonorrhea. Um, Vibrio cholera, we talked a lot about cholera earlier in the course, and Yersinia pestis, which causes the bubonic plague. We'll talk about that in a moment. So uh, many of the um, enteric gram negatives here, uh, the Enterobacteraceae, which is a big group in the proteobacteria, um, they're gram negative bacilli, and they tend to be found in our enteric tract, which is our gut tract. Um, so they're facultative anaerobes. Uh, they can live in both oxygen and without oxygen. They move around so they can travel around through uh, your gut tract. And some of them are what we call commensals. They live with us normally, like E. coli, but some of them are pathogens, like E. coli strain 0157H7, which causes the bloody diarrhea. E. coli is a huge issue for children. It affects children particularly uh, harmfully because uh, they're so small, and when they have things like diarrhea and bleeding and stuff like that, it uh, can become very deadly very quickly. Salmonella, another enteric um, pathogen, also can cause typhoid fever. Um, Klebsiella, uh, major source of hospital-acquired pneumonias, lung infections. And then we have Yersinia pestis, which causes the bubonic plague. There are several common enteric gram negatives listed here. I do not need you to in any way know this. I just wanted to show you that this is an example of a probabilistic indicator. Each of these up here is a different uh, metabolic reaction. So do they make... Uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide or not. Um, salmonella does. Remember, we had those plates that they turned black on because they make hydrogen sulfide. Um, so you can test these different uh, reactions, these um, metabolism reactions. We have uh, different probabilities that they are this organism. So 95% of strains of enterobacter uh, aerogens um, will grow on cinnamon citrate. Um, uh, so you can use this information to identify different things uh, based on the probability that they do these reactions. So these are probably some of our most common pathogens that get dealt with. We're going to talk about one that luckily is not very common, but has been common in the past, Yersinia pestis. Um, this is a very interesting pathogen. And actually, I did some postdoctoral work studying Yersinia pestis and its host, or one of its hosts, the flea, which transmits the bacteria between individuals. Um, there's a related strain called Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, which can cause uh, lung infections. And then there's Yersinia pestis um, that is related to it that causes the plague. Um, these are both gram negatives, bacilli, and they're in this Enterobacteraceae. Um, Pseudotuberculosis generally causes gastrointestinal issues. It can um, cause lung infections occasionally, but generally gastrointestinal. Um, 
and it's transmitted from animals to humans through contaminated food and water, that fecal oral route. Yersinia pestis causes the deadly disease, the plague, and is transmitted from animals to humans with a flea intermediary. And we're going to see that in just a second here. Okay, we have Javier. He's 28 from Colorado, and it's in the month of July. He went to the emergency room uh, because he's had a three-day fever, nausea, vomiting, and a lump in the groin region. Um, we'll come back to this. They diagnose him with food poisoning. They don't really consider the lump to be that important, and they discharge him without any treatment. Three days later, he comes back, and now he is very, very sick. He looks like he's going to die. Um, and he is now hospitalized with a blood infection called sepsis. Both lobes of his lungs contain fluid and white blood cells. This is pneumonia. So now they take everything into account, and he is diagnosed with a presumptive plague. So... We're going to talk about the plague. It is caused by a bacteria that can spread through the blood and can kill you quite rapidly. They treat him with an antibiotic, uh, gentamicin, and he recovers. Um, cultures of his blood uh, and from the swollen lymph nodes, like the one in his groin, grow Yersinia pestis, the causative bacteria. This bacteria grows in the bloodstream of uh, mammals. And it is transmitted by fleas. So the fleas are blood-sucking arthropods that will land on things like rodents. And if the rodent has Yersinia pestis, the bacteria in its bloodstream, the flea takes a blood meal which contains some of that bacteria. The flea can jump onto another rodent and transmit this, and the cycle can continue. When humans stumble into areas that are infested with rodents, uh, the American Southwest has a lot of this. Prairie dogs and other things um, often have uh, Yersinia pestis associated with them. The fleas can jump off of the rodents and onto the humans, and they might bite the humans and transmit the bacteria. So this is really interesting. The interesting part about this is that Yersinia pestis, the bacteria, switches what genes it's expressing based on what temperature uh, it's growing at. So in a mouse, which is at 37, or a human, which is at 37, it expresses one set of genes. But when it gets into the flea, which is at 27 degrees C, much lower, it changes the genes that it expresses. It doesn't express some genes, it turns on other genes. So this this transition from warm to cold to warm signals to the bacteria what is happening. The bacteria, when it gets into the flea, it starts to grow in the gut. So this flea has fed on blood. And this is not a fun process um, to keep fleas around, which we did in the lab that I worked in. Uh, you have to feed them on little tiny baby mice, and they literally suck all of the blood out of them. So it wasn't very fun work, um, but they take this blood meal. And if there are the bacteria, uh, Yersinia pestis in there, the bacteria start to grow when they detect that uh, colder temperature. And they cause this little organ here, basically part of their esophagus, called the proventriculus, they cause it to uh, start getting blocked. So all of this blue colored stuff is bacterial growth. And it forms like a little plug in there. And so when the flea starts to get hungry, you can see all of its blood is starting to get digested there. The blood that it took as a meal, it gets hungry. And it goes out and finds a new mammal to try to suck blood from. But... Its gut is all blocked up, and it can't suck the blood up well. So it keeps trying, it keeps trying, and sometimes some of this bacteria breaks off and flows into the host, transmitting the bacteria. So the bacteria moves from one organism to another through these blocked-up fleas. 
In humans, this causes a bacterial infection, a bacteremia, and then septicemia, which is a severe bacterial infection in the blood. And the blood gets filtered through the lymph nodes and the bacteria starts to grow there and causes swellings. So we have these things called buboes, which are swellings of the lymph nodes, uh, which got ignored in that initial diagnosis there. We have lymph nodes in the groin. We have lymph nodes under the armpits. Uh, as these start to form, it's getting very close to you potentially dying from this. And we've had several worldwide uh, epidemics and pandemics of the plague over the years. Uh, there is still an epidemic of plague in Madagascar uh, right now. So there are many, many cases that occur there still. Uh, luckily, there are very few cases that occur in the United States. Uh, but uh, as, you know, uh, the climate changes and things like that, warmer summers and stuff like that favor plague bacterial growth. There are some other interesting pathogens in the proteobacteria, Legionella pneumophila. Um, this one's interesting because it grows inside of amoeba and also inside of um, human macrophage cells, which are white blood cells. Um, it can be transmitted through um, air conditioners. It's like warm water. Uh, Legionella was originally named this because it was first discovered at a, I think in the 70s, a conference of American legionnaires um, who went to this hotel and Legionella pneumophila was growing in the AC system and a lot of them got infected with this bacteria and some of them died. There's a lot of diversity in here as well. Vibrio cholera, Neisseria gonorrhea, Helicobacter pylori, all common pathogens. There's even some important uh, symbiotic bacteria in here, like rhizobium, the bacteria that fixes nitrogen for plants in peas and legumes. Um, they don't cause disease here, right? They live with the uh, plant. So the other phylum here, the Bacteroidetes. This one is primarily an obligate anaerobe, so they have to live in places without oxygen. Uh, they're a major component of our microbiome in the human colon. Um, they can cause serious infections when they get out of position. So if you have something that punctures your colon, uh, these bacteria can get out and cause serious, uh, severe abscesses and infections. Normally, though, they are non-pathogenic and they ferment a lot of indigestible sugars and derivatives and stuff and actually break down toxins. And we think that they could provide up to 15% of our actual caloric intake. So they take things that we eat and turn it into forms that we can use to make energy. All right, those are our gram negatives. We'll finish up with the next few sections just in one short video.